Okay, so I read The Future of Whiteness um, by Linda Martine Alcoff, and um, the, the premise of the book is that we are approaching a time, and the um, estimate is 2042, where white people will no longer be a majority. And so the question that this book explores is what is the future of whiteness and race relations um, when white people slip under the majority. So um, Alcoff is a professor of philosophy at Hunter College in New York, and she focuses on ep epistemology, feminism, race theory, and existentialism. Um, and she was born in Panama, but grew up in Florida. She moved to Florida when she was like three, I think it said. So throughout the book, um, she's a philosopher, so she talks about a lot in this book. And um, so she kind of starts talking about can white identity exist without racism, um, and how do we answer that question? And then um, also talks about whiteness studies and pushing back against um, some of the scholars um, around whiteness and race studies. She talks about political implications of white people no longer being a majority, and then also what would a future um, with whiteness without racism, like what would that look like? So talking about um, can white people have a white identity without reinforcing racism and other forms of oppression, um, she argues that whiteness is not a fixed category and changes within social and historical contexts, um, and that we can't treat whiteness as something so unique or exceptional that it's unaffected by history and other social contexts. Um, and she really warns against discounting whiteness completely. Um, she says she really finds a middle ground between abolition and supremacy, um, meaning that a world without white supremacy doesn't have to equal a world without whiteness. And um, I thought this quote was interesting in the book. She says, we focus too often on the gap between white and black and brown and miss the growing gap among whites. So she talks a lot about um, a, a young group of white people who are feeling all this white guilt and trying to figure out what to do with that, and that that's sort of the growing gap between people that think racism doesn't exist or don't care about racism and, the, and younger white people who um, are trying to figure out what to do with their whiteness. Um, she does demonstrate throughout the book an awareness of white privilege and oppression, and she doesn't like ignore those issues. Um, I, in one of the videos that I watched of her being interviewed, she talks about it's not that those issues don't exist, but how do we use all this white guilt and feelings to manifest into moving towards a place where whiteness isn't associated with racism. Um, and she also uses her own identity as a Panamanian and white woman as an example of the complexities of whiteness um, and talks about that in different places, so in the United States, having um, any color in you makes you a person of color, where in a lot of other places, having any white in you makes you a white person and sort of that dynamic. Um, she talks a lot about um, the debate between whiteness um, studies and race studies about the future of whiteness. So a lot of um, whiteness scholars argue for what Alcoff calls anti-racist white exceptionalism. Um, and what she says is that basically means that the proposition is to give up on whiteness and say that it just can't exist without racism. Um, and she says that just like any other identity, whiteness should not be considered outside of the influence of history or um, an exception to this rule. And that's what she calls white exceptionalism. Like we're treating it like it's something different than other social identities. Um, so this is a quote from her. She says, the thesis that whiteness is so qualitatively distinct from other social identities that it can never mingle or harmonize is based in a claim about the essential and fixed meaning of whiteness, and in particular, its historical genealogy in white supremacy. And so she feels like that is... Um, is where a lot of scholars are coming from. Um, a lot of scholars, especially critical race theorists, also um, su suggest exactly what she's saying, that whiteness is so intrinsically tied to racism and white supremacy that a future um, without those two things being tied just is impossible. Um, but she really pushes back and says that that is not the case at all, and that um, finding a place where race identities um, are not essentialized or erased, and offers what she calls a realist view, um, that whiteness can be separated from racism, and she calls it a, a quote, place in the rainbow, that there's a place in the rainbow for whites side by side with other groups without power. 
Um, she says that this realist view um, understands identities to be significant aspects of the social world and who we are, um, but without having it be all of our being. So she talked a lot in the book about that social identities are constructed in lots of different ways and not just race and also class and able-bodiedness and religion and all sorts of other things that um, pull together our identities. Um, and when she talks about politics, she also talks about it in a very similar, really, similar way, like that we can't discount whiteness. So she says, um, so one of the things right now is that part of uh, the fact that we have a white majority government, some whites legitimize that by saying, well, we have a white majority constituency, so it would make sense. And so she's saying, well, what happens when there is no longer a white majority constituency? constituency and that's no longer going to be um, an argument and so that justification will soon disappear and so we can't just take away whiteness um, that we have to be able to figure out what that looks like with a, a white dominated um, government and so um, and so she, and what she's concerned about is that she says anti-racism and white exceptionalism, which again are her terms that she associates with um, some of the arguments that other scholars are making, not their terms. Um, but she says that that's ahistorical and it's not taking into account um, a lot of transracial collective action that has taken place. And so to just say that we need to do away with whiteness um, is what she calls particular politically counterproductive because it takes away from potential transracial action in the future. She also argues that these paternalistic attitudes of white liberals, especially like in the 60s in terms of I'm going to like help uplift you and I'm pro-integration but I'm going to keep my kids in separate schools, um, that that sort of idea is eroding. And, um, and talks about that whites are not so white anymore and uses examples of the Obama family and the Bush family as multiracial families um, is when she talks about um, politics. So then lastly, she talks about what it would mean um, for whites to more, and this, these are her words, positively embody, um, be embodied as white within a multipolar social landscape. So she acknowledges that whiteness will be the, the primary um, for the foreseeable future will be powerful and um, will continue to shape reality for all people. And so how can whiteness be lived in ways that are not intrinsically tied to racism? Um, and she poses that question, but doesn't really answer it. So she talks about that white people um, because become allies most often out of moral outrage or white guilt, and again talks about um, all of these young people and what do we do with that energy and that moral outrage and that guilt. Um, but she doesn't answer the question about what it would mean. The only way that she does answer it is by offering two stories about two um, white men that she feels um, exhibit, what did she call it, positively inhabiting whiteness. So the first was um, Bob Zellner, who was a white field coordinator for SNCC, and um, said he wasn't acting just for black people. He also felt that Southern racism was a violation of white rights as well. And so she kind of goes into details about why she feels like he was positively exhibiting his whiteness, um, just in the sense that he was acting for the greater good of everybody. Um, and then the second person she talked about was C.P. Ellis, um, who is a leading member of the KKK in, um, I didn't write it down, but I think it was North Carolina. And, um, and he um, got involved as a, lo a really low income white person, thinking that it would bring him social status. But then um, once school started to be integrated, he was snubbed by his fellow Klan members because he didn't have the money to put his kids in private school like everybody else did. So he started getting involved in the schools and ended up leading the Klan and becoming um, like a, a civil rights activist in some ways. And, um, and he really talked about wanting a smooth um, path to integrated schools, um, both for his own kids but also for kids generally. Um, and she 
says, and as I was, so she says at the end after she's talking about C.P. Ellis, she says like something to the effect of you might note some sympathy for this person and that is there because she um, believes that he experienced deeply oppressive circumstances um, and found a way to resist them by acting on behalf of himself and of um, a wide variety of people. So um, you can probably tell by my tone that I struggled a lot with this book. Um, I think that a strength is that um, personally, so if, if you ask me like, you know, of all the issues in the world, um, the future of whiteness is not like something I'm particularly concerned about. But so it forced me to think about it because it's not something I really think about. Um, and even if I don't, even if I say that I don't care about it, so many people do. And so if we are going to um, work from an anti-racism perspective, we do need to think about these things. So I think that that was like a strength. It sort of forced me to think about it. Um, and. I didn't initially think of this as a strength, but as I was reading some reviews and what other people said, a lot of people talked about her, um, that this was a risky move for her to write this book. Um, it really pushes back against a lot of other scholars in, in this realm, and it, some people called it brave. I would just say it's risky. Um, and so I guess that that is a strength, you know, that she put it out there. And whether or not I agree with this approach, um, it does pose a different way to combat white supremacy and a different way to talk to my fellow white people and to think about these things. So, so that is a strength that offers a different um, way to do things. So, um, and then the biggest weakness is so I have um, part of my or part of my undergrad was philosophy, and so reading it, I was like, oh, I forgot <laughs> what reading from philosophers are. Like, it's a very different style of writing, and um, and so that was I just think a weakness in the sense of it being relatable for everybody, and also I think a weakness in terms of me being able to totally grasp what she was saying. Um, I think that if it was written in a different style, I might be less critical of it. Um, and I also, because I think that if it was written in a different style, I would feel more confident that I totally understood what she was asserting. Um, but I think the way it's written, I would need to read it like another couple times to feel more confident that I really am like following what she's trying to say. Um, I and you know and the main thing that concerned me about this book is if we start talking about these things or continue to talk about these things are we detracting from the bigger issue of how to dismantle white supremacy and how to like uh, create a culture of safety for people of color um, or does this help with that and I think in my mind I worry that it detracts but I realize that in her mind it helps with it so I think that it's just like a different perspective. Um, and it doesn't really make predictions or suggestions. Like she poses this huge question, but then doesn't really follow through, which I think was frustrating for me. Um, and I think especially, you know, we've seen that a lot of our authors don't necessarily answer all of our questions and like tie it up in a neat little bow. But I think when you're um, proposing something so controversial, you need to follow through with it a little bit more. I think I have like higher expectations because it's a little more controversial. Um, I thought I would read you um, the very, last part of the book um, because it was definitely a little bit of like a trigger for me and so I'm interested in what people think. So she said, whites who take up the challenge of ending the spread of white supremacist ideas and eroding the white material advantages still accruing from slavery and colonialism are incorrectly understood to be allies. They are activists in their own right coming into the movement in two ways. First, as human beings too, as Baldwin's colleague put it, and second, as white people who refuse to perpetuate the practice of white support of or apathy toward the oppression of non-white people. Um, so she finishes that thought, but basically, like, she very clearly asserts that um, we, that, like, white activists are not allies, but they're activists. Um, and I think, like, my just final thought about this is that I think that the main reason that I'm really pushing back on these ideas is that it doesn't align with my lived experience, which I realize is, like, just one perspective, but my lived experience is that my whiteness is so intrinsically and tied to privilege and white supremacy and the opportunities that I've had in life, um, and so it's really hard for me to imagine a world where those two things are not one and the same. Um, any, I would really love to hear thoughts and questions because I'm obviously struggling with it a little bit, but what do you guys think? Questions for our presenters. You answered a lot of my questions as we were talking, but I wonder, <laughs> I, like, I was, well, that's a good question to ask her, but I wonder, like, how realistic do 
like, is there a future where, like, we can all be on a level playing field and, like, power is removed? Like, that... Yeah, and I think that's where, like, it's so hard. I don't think it's realistic, but I also, I think I also had this feeling as I was reading, is like, this is a, a person who has, has spent a lot of time and energy like thinking about and researching this, is, so it feels a little weird to say that I know more than her, so I keep going back to just my lived experience, and I can't imagine that. Um, and I think part of the reason I can't imagine that is because I think that our identities are so tied up in history, which she's also making the same argument that they're tied up in history, but I think we're just looking at it from very different perspectives. Like, I don't know how whiteness could ever um, be separated from the, the history of oppression and colonialism. Um, so yeah, my answer is like, no, I don't think that's realistic. Does she, I mean, you said that she proposes these big questions and doesn't really follow through with it. Mm -hmm. Does she ever kind of address, I guess, that issue of the historical context and kind of how whiteness is, is kind of charged and loaded? Like, does she have an answer to Diverging those? Or like yeah. Those um, not that I know. I don't think so. Like when she was talking about history, she was talking about how, like, their, you know, whiteness as we know it today looks very different than 20 years ago and 20 years before that. And, you know, that, um, so that, like, Jewish people weren't always considered white, right? And, and all of these types of things, and to some people still aren't considered white. And so, um, and she also talked about that um, a lot of white people fled their own forms of oppression that they were experiencing in their country. So like, oppression is a part of all of our histories, I guess. Um, but no, so I don't, and I think that was also like a big trigger for me, like that I felt like she was sort of comparing different oppressions as if they're all equal, which I felt like, which bothered me. Um, but so yeah, I, I don't think that she really answered that question. But like I said, I really feel like I want to like read it again in six months and see if I have a different reaction. <laughs> like that I think that um, I, I feel like there could definitely be a lot that I was missing just because of the writing style. And yeah. So the scholarship on whiteness is legion. There's just tons and tons of have written on it. Yeah. Um, her voice is somewhat unique in that I do think much of that literature is somewhat ideologically lockstep. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'm impressed by her work is that she is willing, I don't know if we need to talk about brave or not brave, that's really not an issue for me, but that she's causing some rethinking of the received wisdom. I think that's good, particularly the argument about the concept of whiteness being treated as a historical concept. That is of the many criticism that has been pushed back against white scholarship by people who are not in sympathy with it, that one I think has sort of found the most purchase and scholars have really had to come to terms with how can we make it historically situated. Mm -hmm. How do you live that out is the question, right? Yeah. And there's a certain point at which I find the whiteness uh, historiography and, and theory a little bit irrelevant to a degree because it's all about, okay, what are you going to do in your life now? How, from my perspective, how are you going to make a difference where you are to make it so that you're not, that whiteness isn't going to be perpetuated the same way for the next generation of right now? Yeah. Did you feel like you were better equipped to that question when you read that book? Um, so I'm having trouble separating the book from um, the like interview that I watched because I felt like in the interview she did a much better job of addressing what you're talking about and and she talked a lot about we have all this energy from all these young white people who want to to do different and or to do better or whatever the right way is to look at that um, but no I don't think that she really gave specific things about how to do that differently um, but I also like wasn't necessarily expecting her to as soon as I read that she was a philosopher because I feel like that's not necessarily and not and not to like not but just like that's not like in my experience with like philosophy that's not the perspective you're coming from. Um, she's like in in terms of the fix it mentality. Um, so, but I, I guess I wanted that just because she does push back and it is kind of risky or different. Yeah. What's it like to read Venice compared? The last book you wrote was The Killing Rage, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that 
like some of your resistance? I know you talked about how like your personal experience differed from the philosophy in this book, but do you think like the philosophy in your last book like really aided in that pushback that you have personally for this one? Yeah, that's a really good question. I was thinking about it a lot, and the other thing I was thinking about is that um, Bell Hooks is criticized for not being academic enough, and this book is like much more academic, and so like I was thinking about like that, but. Um, I don't know if like that book specifically, but I think I've done a lot of reading in the last year, um, especially by like authors and people of color and coats and um, and so I I think that like the culmination of as a whole, I think there were things that um, I have to admit that as I was reading, there were things where it's like if I was in a room and a white man said what she's saying, I would probably be really triggered, but I felt more inclined to just like keep going with it because it was in a book and because she identified as a person of color and so I was kind of like thinking about how all of those pieces, whether or not that's like relevant or fair. Um, yeah, I don't know if I, I'm not answering your question, but, but no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Does, well, she, be the last question for okay. Does she discuss at all the institutional racism and like the fact that, because uh, you talked about like white like power and history and things like that, but does she discuss how like institutional racism is like a problem that should also be addressed or does she just kind of like put it as history? Yeah, yeah. No, she, no, I don't think that she's discounting that there are like there's still current forms of racism both institutional and relational. Like she doesn't discount that at all but she doesn't explain it or go into it because I think it's sort of she's coming from the perspective of um, like these things exist, but how do we move forward? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that she ignores it. Um, it didn't really bother me that she didn't give credit to it because I don't think that was the point of the book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Did that? yeah. <laughs> I actually had a similar question, but I didn't know how to increase it.